And we begin tonight with a theme that is, um, on the one hand, not so controversial, on the other, it's deceptively simple. Arguably, Jesus is among the most influential teachers in world history. I don't think I'm going to cause too much upset. Even if you're a bit skeptical about the whole Christianity thing, you're probably going to agree he had a massive influence. I mean, for one thing, some of his throwaway lines became proverbs in multiple languages. I mean, salt of the earth, love thy neighbor, do to others as you would have them do to you. The good Samaritan, the prodigal son, the blind leading the blind, judge not lest you be judged. Wolf in sheep's clothing, cast the first stone, eat, drink and be merry. Sign of the times, go the extra mile. These all come from Jesus. And I did a little social media test a couple of years ago, asking uh, some of my <laughs> friends um, who speak other languages as a, as a first language, um, how many of these are proverbs that people say in French and German and uh, Italian and so on? And I was blown away by how many of these, what seem to me, English proverbs are actually also proverbs in multiple languages. And they're all from the lips of Jesus. And sometimes people um, say things Jesus said without knowing that Jesus said them. I mean, many of these you'll hear on the radio or in the New York Times, and people have no idea where they came from. They're just, you know, we should all go the extra mile, not knowing it actually comes from his lips. Well, I remember speaking to a, a prominent Australian politician who was describing his leadership style to me, and he said, I've always followed the JFK principle, to whom much is given, much is required. And, and, and it was a delightful conversation because I was able to point out that actually is something Jesus said from Luke 12. It's even older than JFK. And he was <laughs> delighted to hear that it had such a fine pedigree. Even people who uh, were nowhere near being Christians uh, accept that, that Jesus was a remarkable teacher. Think of Albert Einstein who, though he was not an atheist, he certainly wasn't a Christian or even any kind of orthodox Jew. He, he, he sits in a very interesting space religiously. But in an interview, he said this about Jesus. I am enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. No one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. No one can deny the fact that Jesus existed, nor that his sayings are beautiful. The smartest man in the room talking about the influence of Jesus. But Jesus' influence goes way beyond beautiful sayings, as Einstein uh, puts it. Uh, two information scientists, neither of whom uh, is, is a Christian, invented an algorithm to discover who has had most impact on the world. They put about a thousand historical figures into their algorithm, from Aristotle to Einstein. And to their own surprise, as people who are not at all religious believers, these two scholars discovered that by their algorithm, Jesus is the number one most influential figure in world history. And it was really interesting because Stephen Skiena, Professor Stephen Skiena, um, is actually an atheist. And in the interviews I read uh, about their, their published uh, work, he was obviously embarrassed <laughs> as an atheist to say that Jesus was so successful. And, he, and he, he ended up saying, well, obviously Jesus was the most successful meme in world history. An interesting way to put it. But we can go beyond that. Samuel Moyne is Professor of Law and History at Yale University and one of the leading authorities on human rights and equality. And he is not a Christian. But when asked about the impact of Jesus, he remarked... I don't doubt that, that Jesus Christ in particular um, brought about a revolution um, in thinking of people as, uh, as equal in the sight of God. Later, 
this idea of moral equality became an ideal of political equality. And there's no doubt that that's caused the world to change drastically. I guess what I'm saying is you'd be hard pressed to think of a teacher who has had more impact on world history than Jesus of Nazareth. So even if you're not sure what to make of the Christian faith, it's just a grown-up thing to do to try and get your head around this remarkable figure. And over the next four weeks, we're going to try and do that. But there are, on this topic of Jesus as teacher, uh, two equal and opposite mistakes that are very easy to make. One is a mistake made by the general society. The other is a mistake made inside the church. And I want to talk about uh, both of them. Mistake number one is to think of Jesus as just a teacher. So many people in wider society are very happy with Jesus the teacher. He's like the great life coach. He's the guru. He said some lovely things. Can we just leave it there, please? Because all the stuff about miracles and Jesus dying and rising again, that's spooky. And I don't believe it. I don't like it. Can we just stay with Jesus the teacher? It's a very common view. I I remember being uh, in a radio interview in Australia on ABC, which is the equivalent of NPR, and not known for being overly favorable toward Christianity. And I was on a Christmas program where I got to talk about the life of Jesus for about half an hour, and it went okay, uh, but then they opened it for live calls from the listening public, and I thought, oh no, here we go, because it's it's your classic left-wing, skeptical kind of audience. But every caller, and there must have been at 10 at least, had positive things to say about Jesus. And I sat there as caller after caller said, oh, I love what he taught about peace, or I love what he taught about love, or I love how he really gave it to those religious authorities. (laughs) And I came away thinking, wow, people do respect Jesus, but at the same time, they contain him. Just a teacher. Now, um, this has a very long pedigree, this view of Jesus just as teacher. You may have never heard of Ernest Renan. He is a 19th century French historian and philosopher who wrote one of the most successful books of the 19th century, translated into multiple languages, millions sold, and in the 19th century, that's an incredible uh, number of books to sell. And his book, Life of Jesus, was... A, an account of Jesus' life, hi- historically speaking, that stripped Jesus of all the spooky stuff, all the miracles, all the I am the Messiah, you know, all the death and resurrection stuff, and just left us with a beautiful Galilean teacher who told everyone to be nice to each other. Now, even if you've never heard the name Ernest Renan, You probably have been influenced by his perspective because this idea caught on like wildfire throughout Europe and then throughout the rest of the world. Let's just think of Jesus as a teacher and leave it there. Interestingly, nowadays, scholars, um, even who are slightly skeptical about the whole uh, Christianity thing, would regard Renan as a classic example of something we are all prone to do. And that is, project our own wishes onto Jesus. He was a 19th century French humanist. And you know what? He turned Jesus into a first century Galilean French humanist. (laughs) And we can all do that. Whether we're believers or skeptics, we can just pick and choose what we want about Jesus. There's an equal and opposite error. It isn't thinking of Jesus only as a teacher. The second error is sort of to go the other way, and it's an error the church sometimes makes. In an effort to counteract this exaggerated perception of Jesus as a teacher, sometimes the church downplays his role as teacher and elevates his significance as Savior and Lord so that you would hardly think that we need to remember and obey all those teachings. I I remember being very impressed 
when I went to seminary and uh, did theology, that in my New Testament lecture, the professor pointed out to us with all the correct statistics that about 20% of the Gospels, they are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, our first century biographies of Jesus' life, about 20% are devoted to the last three days of Jesus' life. The, the arrest, um, trial, crucifixion, burial, resurrection. And his point was, how amazing that 20% of the life of Jesus focuses on three days. And the point was meant to be, that should be our focus. The, the, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. And I thought, that's fantastic. And it was ages before it dawned on me that that means 80% is about all the other stuff. I was never, never very good at maths. Um, so I was so wowed by that 20% on three days. But 80% is all the other stuff, uh, Jesus' teachings, which we're looking at tonight, and also his healings. What do we make of that? Well, next week, I've got some fun to talk about uh, the healings. See, my seminary was making the opposite error, the error of downplaying Jesus' teachings. When the fact is, the teaching of Jesus remains to this day a topic of serious historical inquiry, not just amongst um, Christian professors in seminaries, but history scholars across the universities. Here are my 117 books on the historical Jesus sitting on my shelf in my office in Wheaton. Every one of these 117 books on the historical Jesus, every one of them, has a significant section devoted to the teacher Jesus, because his teaching is radical, his role uh, is uh, full of historical surprises. Among the most important ever written were this one, Jesus as Teacher by Rainer Riesner. Um, y yes, it's in German. Much of the good historical stuff on Jesus is, sadly, in German. But one of the things that uh, Professor Riesner did is he showed how uh, Jesus compared to other rabbis in his period. And Jesus both compares and contrasts with those rabbis. And significantly, Reasoner um, has demonstrated that a huge proportion of the teachings of Jesus, like the sayings I read out earlier or the, or the Sermon on the Mount that we saw on the screen, were designed for memorization. We can tell because there are all these little techniques built into the structure of the sayings that reveal a teacher who wanted students to memorize the material. So that it isn't that the apostles heard a sermon Jesus gave one day and 30 years later thought, what was that about? And wrote the gospel. No, they had committed to memory these sayings because the sayings themselves were designed for memorization. Um, another book, if you want one in English, is Jesus as Teacher, uh, put out by uh, Professor Feeney Perkins of Boston College. And it's a wonderful, uh, just about 150-page book that shows how Jesus compared to all sorts of Greek and Roman teachers in the period and the Jewish teachers of his day. But here's something that is a well-kept secret. Even non-Christian writers in the first century, in the century in which Jesus lived, noted how famous Jesus was and influential he was as a teacher. You may have never heard of Flavius Josephus, but he was a Jewish writer, he was a Jewish uh, army general, and on two occasions in his uh, history of the Jewish people, he references Jesus. It's one of the reasons um, uh, professors of ancient history are certain Jesus lived, because it isn't just Christian documents that refer to his life, but we also have non-Christian documents. But here's what Josephus says in the first century. About this time, there lived Jesus, a wise man, for he was one who wrought surprising feats. I'll talk about that one next week, because it's a non-Christian's way of talking about those spooky miracles. But then he says, and he was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly, and he won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. 
The well-kept secret is we have 11 references to Jesus from ancient non-Christian writers. Even if we never had a Bible, we could piece together the broad story of Jesus just from things non-Christian writers say about Him. And one of the things they say about Him is He won a lot of people to His teaching. But of course, the Gospels, which are even earlier than Josephus, are very clear about the importance of Jesus as a teacher. We learn from the Gospels, for example, that it was the principal activity of Jesus every day. I don't know if you ever stop and think about what Jesus would have done. You know, he wakes up, has brekkie, then what does he do? Do you not say brekkie? <laughs> did, I, did I just do an Aussie thing that's a bit weird? Okay. Um, what was I saying? Okay, what does Jesus do? What does Jesus do? Well, we learn from the Gospels, he spent most of his days, every day, teaching. In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day, I sat in the temple courts teaching. Every day. Uh, we know that the word teacher is one of the main titles people would use when they addressed Jesus. You know how like when you think of addressing Jesus, those of you who say prayers every now and then, you would say what? Lord? Saviour? I bet you don't ever go, dear teacher. Right? If you try that in, in your little church group one day, open your prayer. Here's a challenge, right? Let's do it this week. In your prayer, just go, dear Jesus, our teacher, and just watch the other Christians be creeped out. <laughs> but it was how people addressed him in his day, including from his faithful disciples. Over 30 times in the Gospels, people come up to him and their first word is, teacher. Here's one of my favorite examples because it tells you how um, instinctive it was to call Jesus teacher. This is the scene where there's a raging storm on the Sea of Galilee and the disciples are panicking because Jesus is asleep, right? And there's a great big storm. They think they're going to drown. And look what it says. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Of all the things you might Think of calling Jesus in that moment. Like, wouldn't you have gone for Lord or Captain? <laughs> no, teacher, teacher. So um, I guess my point is perhaps the church and the general public have something to teach each other about this thing. Yes, the church can remind the general public that Jesus was more than a teacher. But I reckon the general public can remind the church he was really a teacher. And to downplay that is just silly. So there are the two mistakes that are easy to make around our topic. Uh, I want to try now and do the impossible, if that's okay. I'm going to summarize Jesus' teaching, okay, in about 11 minutes, okay? The content of Jesus' teaching. Now, fortunately, there is a strong consensus amongst uh, historical scholars, and when I say that, I don't mean theology professors, I mean historical scholars, a strong consensus that the central theme of Jesus' teaching was the kingdom of God. The evidence for this is overwhelming. And I know that sounds airy-fairy, uh, ethereal. The kingdom of God? Like, is that about like going to heaven when you die? No. It was a classic Jewish concept that was already embedded in his culture. Jews taught, because the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures already taught, that one day 
God would prove himself king over all things and make all things well. He would restore justice where there is injustice. He'd bring love where there is hate. He would make all things well. And they called this the kingdom of God because it's God proving himself to be king. Um, in, a, in a sense, if you have ever wished the Almighty would do something about the mess of our world, you've wished for the kingdom of God, even if you never called it that. And kingdom of God is everywhere in Jesus' teachings. He would often start parables, those lovely pictorial uh, stories with a punchline, with an expression like this. Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds perched in its branches. His point being, the kingdom of God is going to start small, and then it's going to grow large. Or think of the famous, Our Father, or the Lord's Prayer, whichever uh, title we give this prayer. It has a prayer for the coming kingdom built into it. This is how you should pray, Jesus said, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a prayer that God would come and prove himself king, make all things well, do something about the mess in the world. Now, this broader theme of the kingdom of God informs all of Jesus' teaching, including all the ethical stuff that most people want to associate with Jesus' teaching. Most people like to say, what Jesus taught was love and peace and joy and niceness or something, right? And in a sense, they're right. But we sometimes miss the logic. The way Jesus thought about this was, the kingdom of God is going to come and make all things well, establishing love where there is hate, humility where there is arrogance, peace where there is war. So, if people believe in the kingdom, they get busy with those things now. You don't wait for the kingdom to come. You get busy doing love now because one day it's going to be the only ethic in town. You get busy practicing peace now because we know God will come and bring peace on earth. So this is the way Jesus thought about ethics. It's, it's uh, if I can put it like this, anticipatory. It anticipates the future kingdom of God, love. And here we come very close to the heart of the content of Jesus' teaching, love. Perhaps the most remarkable set of uh, sayings Jesus uttered were these. We heard a version of it in the video. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Honestly, I think these are the most sublime words ever uttered. And if you think you can find an ethic that is superior to this in the history of humanity ever uttered, please come and tell me. Maybe you can bring it up in Q&A. But I have for years posted this on social media and asked people, can you think of anything? Anything from the Stoics? Anything from the great Indian gurus that approaches the sublimity of these sayings? 
I'd love to hear it. Now, not everyone agrees, okay? Not everyone agrees. In fact, uh, someone you may have never heard of, but he's quite a big deal in Australia because he's a, quite an important public intellectual as this man, Hugh McKay. Hugh McKay is a sociologist. He's always on TV and radio. He's very thoughtful, mi- you know, uh, written many, many books about really important topics. And in 2016, he wrote this book, Beyond Belief. And it was uh, his account of why we don't need religion. We don't need religion to undergird or give a logic to our practice of love. We can have a community of love and equality and mercy without any of the religious mumbo-jumbo. It's quite a popular idea nowadays. Even if it's true, as Samuel Moyne from Yale University said in that clip I showed you, that Jesus gave the world its idea of equality, Hugh McKay would say, we don't need it. We can get on without any of the spiritual stuff. And along the way in this book, he made two interesting arguments, and I just want to I just want to reflect on them because I think they reveal something important about Christianity and something important about today's skepticism. One, he says, Jesus' golden rule, the one I just quoted, do to others as you would have them do to you, is, quote, found in virtually all philosophies and religions. In other words, there's nothing special about Jesus. We get this same saying, everywhere. The second thing he said, which was pretty daring in my view, he said, Jesus never told anyone what to believe in. He only spoke about how to treat each other. And I guess what he's trying to do there is reduce Jesus simply to a moral teacher. He just told you to be nice to each other. Stop there. Don't go into all that other stuff. I think that's what he's doing. Okay, What can we make of these arguments from a very important public intellectual who's not a Christian? Well, on the first one, um, the only parallel McKay offers to the golden rule comes from Confucius. And in uh, Analects, the the famous book uh, collating Confucius's sayings, we read this, do not inflict on others what you yourself would not wish done to you. That's pretty cool. Let's all do that from now on. And I think the planet would be happier. So I'm all for Confucius. Do not inflict on others what you yourself would not wish done to you. But here's my question. Is it what Jesus said? Jesus said, do to others what you would have them do to you. I want to say I love Confucius's rule, but I think I have to call it the silver rule. Would that be all right? Like, almost went for gold and came second. Because it's what you might call a negative principle of reciprocity. Don't do the bad thing to other people that you don't want done to yourself. So don't be mean if you don't want people to be mean back to you. It's a good rule. Let's all live that at the very least. But it isn't what Jesus said. What Jesus was saying, no, you do the positive thing to others that you would like them to do to you. And and when you think of it, these are universes apart. It's like the difference between my deciding not to punch my enemy in the nose and deciding to build my enemy a hospital. They are not the same idea. What Jesus said is unique. I remember interviewing Geza Vermesh some years ago now. He, he died in 2013 and, and uh, I was involved in an Australian TV documentary about the life of Jesus. Um, and we filmed Geza in about 2010. Um, he, he was the professor of Jewish studies at Oxford University for three decades, translated the Dead Sea Scrolls, wrote eight books on the life of Jesus, wrote all about Israel in the Roman Empire. 
an amazing, amazing guy. So when we knew that we got the interview with Gaze of Amesh, we were pumped. So I turn up at, uh, at, at this gorgeous um, manor just on the edge of Oxford to interview him. And our theme with him was going to be Jesus' love command, the kind of love your neighbor, love your enemy, and that sort of stuff. And the first thing he said to me was, John, you know, don't you, that Jesus got his emphasis on love from his Judaism. I said, yes, Professor Vermesh, I know that because I've read the Old Testament and I've read your books. I know, yes. And then he said, good. But Jesus radicalized the love command so that love your neighbor now was transformed into love your enemy, love the sinner, love the leper, love the foreigner. It was an amazing experience being reminded of the unique nature of Jesus' teaching from the greatest living professor of Judaism in the world. What of Hugh McKay's second suggestion, that Jesus never told anyone what to believe in, he only spoke about how to treat each other? Well, I mean, leaving aside all those times Jesus said, believe in me, right? <laughs> like, which is a lot of times. But even leaving that aside, um, the, this, this famous statement that I cited a moment ago, the love command, actually is premised on certain beliefs. Hugh McKay is trying to um, divorce ethics from any view of spirituality, but actually Jesus shoves them together. Love makes sense, so Jesus taught, because it's what God is like. Why be kind to an enemy? Because God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Why be merciful to people? Jesus said, because your Father in heaven is merciful. For Jesus, ethics isn't just sort of arbitrary sayings, you know, little commands and proverbs and aphorisms. No, it's about reality. For Jesus, love makes sense because God is love and because God in His kingdom is going to bring love to this sometimes loveless planet. Jesus pursued love all the way to His own cross, where this idea of love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, Jesus embodied. Um, when Jesus said in His famous Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, He knew that in just a couple of years, He'd be arrested by His enemies, and they would beat him and scourge him, falsely convict him and crucify him. And Jesus knew that he did that for them. It's perhaps for another talk, but Jesus taught that his death was in our place. We who have opposed God, we who deserve divine judgment for our lack of love, can be freely forgiven because Jesus took it all on the cross. So, so what I'm trying to say, I'm not trying to get too theological, though a little bit of theology never hurt anyone, but without going too deeply into it, my point is this, for Jesus, the, the love command isn't the, just a, it isn't just an intensification of the silver rule. It, it isn't an arbitrary command plucked from nowhere. It is his whole life was about it. Because he taught that all of God was about it. The love of the enemy. It's probably more accurate to say... Jesus never taught us how to treat each other without explaining what we are to believe in, to inspire it. 
his point is, because God is love, love makes sense. Here's the double lesson uh, for the church and maybe for wider society too. We cannot separate the Saviour from the teacher. We cannot separate the teacher from the Saviour. Um, if we think of Jesus only as a teacher and not as the Saviour who died for us, His teaching will condemn you. As in, you'll read it and you'll go, I can't do that. I'm, I'm dead. I mean, the, the radical call to love that He brought into this world, you read it and you say, I can't do that. But if you think of it simply as an external moral command about improving your life, it'll, it'll make you feel guilty. It'll be a burden you cannot bear. But if you know that this life of love is in the end a reflection of the love that God already has for us, the love of Christ already poured into the world when He died for us, if you know that we're loved first, our love is just the sometimes dodgy reflection of that love. But here's a word for the Christian in the room. In our lives, we sometimes think of Jesus as Saviour without embracing Him wholeheartedly as our teacher. And you know what? When we do that, we, the church, become hypocrites. Just resting in the idea, God loves me, God loves me, and just not worrying about the teachings of Jesus. And I reckon if, if you're here tonight and you're not sure if you're a Christian, you don't know what to make of it, I bet one of your reasons for just holding at a distance from Christianity is because you've seen religious hypocrites and it's ugly. So there's a challenge here for all of us, for the Christian to embrace Jesus as teacher. Don't just rest on His love as a Savior. Follow Him as teacher. But on the other hand, if you're someone here who just thinks of Jesus as a teacher, I, I, I'm just saying, His teaching will just make you guilty unless you add to it the wonderful news that He loves you and gave His life for you so you can be clean and forgiven. There's a double corrective. We can't separate the Savior from the teacher, the teacher from the Savior. I met a young man about 15 years of age at a um, talk I did at a high school. I not so much anymore, um, but I used to give lots of speeches at school assemblies. It was great fun. And I'd often be able to talk about my Christian faith. And I remember this one particular school assembly, you know, several hundred high school students, and you know, I tried to be interesting and even funny, and uh, got them, you know, to sort of hear a little about the Christian faith. And afterwards, this young man came up to me. I remember his name, Nick. And he said, oh, I'm really interested in all that God stuff. I said, Great, How, what, what have you been doing? And he, and he brought out of his bag, amazing, he, he had... Um, a, a, like a university textbook on psychology, a university textbook on philosophy. I said, this is how you're trying to get to know God? He said, yeah, I asked one of my teachers, and my teachers didn't have a clue, but they said, here, read some of my university textbooks. I said, okay, and what else have you been doing? And he said, well, I've been trying to weigh up if I'm good. I went, okay, ha are you? He said, oh, well, let me show you. And he reached in and he pulled out um, 
I don't know what you call them in America, like a, we call them exercise books, um, like a, a log book or just a notebook with lines in it. What would you call it? An exercise book. An exercise book. <laughs> oh, no. ah. Anyway, did you sort of know what I mean? Like, look, anyway, whatever. And, um, and he showed me, and he had um, drawn columns on each page, and across the top, the days of the week, right? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday. and down the left-hand column, like an accounting column, a whole bunch of principles he thought Jesus would like. You know, love, peace, kindness, whatever, right? And then he had given himself a score out of 10 for every virtue, for every day of the week, for pages and pages and pages. Oh, I didn't know whether to laugh at him or cry. This beautiful little kid who's trying to work out and, and he was so honest because sometimes he got five and six. Often he was down in like one and two. That book condemned him. If that book was his way to salvation, he was gone. And so there was this angst in his voice. Is this what I should be doing? And I had the enormous privilege of just explaining to him something of what I've said to you tonight. That that's not how Christianity works. If you try and just follow Jesus' teaching as just a, an external ethic, it will condemn you. It'll make you feel guilty. But the great news of Christianity is that God already loves you. And He wants you to practice love and peace and all those things as reflections of His love for you, which is there already. I said, Jesus took all your failings, all those ones and twos that you're worried about. Jesus took it all when he died for you, I said. It was fantastic. This, this kid, this 15-year-old, had a tear well up in his eye and he got this exercise book and he went over to the school bin and he quite dramatically threw it away. I had the privilege of staying in touch with this guy for about two years afterwards. We'd write back and forth to each other as he began to grow in this knowledge of the teacher who is also the saviour. The saviour who is the teacher. Well, thank you so much. I look forward to hearing your questions now. Great. Well, tomorrow at Brecky, I'm going to bring out my exercise book. <laughs> what do you call supper? Dinner? Suppy? Dinner. <laughs> Dinner? All right. We have uh, so, several questions that were texted in, but let's start with some that may be live in the room. If you have them, feel free to stand up. We have a couple uh, lovely assistants. With microphones, Sterling and Joe will come around and just, just put your hand up, they'll bring it to you. I know it's a large room and you might feel a little bit weird about it, but it's a great chance for us just to talk and, uh, and, and discuss what this really means for us. So if you've got a question that popped up in your mind, um, go ahead and ask it. One, while we're waiting for someone to get the courage to ask it out loud. Oh, right there we go. Uh, while you're making your way over to her. Oh, you got it? Good, we'll ask that one first. Go ahead. What happened to a 15-year-old after three years? Um, I don't know, we just, we just sort of, you know, started writing less frequently and then I realised, oh, I haven't written to Nick for a year and then I didn't, so I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I was on the road in those days, so I, I wasn't anywhere, live anywhere near him, um, so I, I'm sorry, I don't have, don't have any extra information to give you. He, oh, so, but in those... In those days after our, our conversation, yeah, he, he, um, he developed a full-blown faith in Christianity and started going to church where he was taught really well. And my, my writing to him was just, he had lots of questions, and, and so I'd write back, yeah. Dr. Dixon, when you were talking about how... So I can hear the voice, but I have no right idea. Here. Oh, right, okay. Uh, <clears throat> how Jesus was just, if you look at him as just teacher... Is the, the thought occurred to me, is that why the rich young ruler just walked away? Like, it, 
it was one more thing. Right. And didn't so with. yeah. Um, The rich young ruler is obviously there and interested in Jesus as a teacher. But then when Jesus says, oh, you know, all you need to do is sell your possessions and give to the poor. I think at that point his teaching became too extreme for the rich ruler. And the inner meaning of that passage is obviously that Jesus isn't there just to give you ethical advice. He does ask for a profound loyalty to himself that the rich young ruler was not willing to do. So in a sense, you could say the rich young ruler wanted Jesus to be just another rabbi giving advice, but he was confronted with a Lord who demanded his life, and that's too much. Yeah. One from a texture here. Um, is it possible for one to follow Stoic teachings, like those of Marcus Aurelius, and still also follow Jesus' teachings in a meaningful quote-unquote, Christian way? Huh, good question. Stoicism, oh boy. Can we do the Stoicism lecture? Yes, yes we can. <laughs> Stoicism. Okay. So Stoicism starts about two and a half, three centuries before Jesus. And no, I'm not going to give the full lecture. But um, yeah, Zeno the philosopher used to walk through the Stoa uh, in Athens and give his teachings, and from the, his walking through the Stoa, we get Stoicism. And, and basically, he taught this philosophy that became really famous for the next 500 years. That says the, the moral life is all about the middle way. Then you must control all of your passions and emotions, controlling them by rationality. So you must never be too overjoyed, but nor should you be sad. Because if you are too overjoyed, you're letting external things control you. But you need to control the world. If something makes you really upset, you're allowing the world to control you, but you need to control the world, yeah? So, the middle path, neither, neither this way nor that way. And so, um, Stoics were better than your average pagan because they weren't into violence, uh, because that, that would be to break the middle way, but nor were they into charity. Because that would be too extreme. They thought to feel the pain of other people who are going through suffering was perverse. Because what are you doing? You're allowing their pain to control you. And you have to control all things. This is Stoicism. So, can you do that and be a full-blown follower of Jesus Christ? Think and no. Thinking no. Can you learn certain tips from the Stoics about how to sort of not overreact? Yes. The Stoics left us some really nice sayings that, you know, that are wise and, and just about every second bookshop has you know, the sayings of the Stoics, Marcus Aurelius' greatest hits, right? Um, and sure, you can find lots of lovely things there. But in the end, Stoicism faded away and Christianity took over because people worked out the middle way is passive and negative. We want something that will weep with those who weep. Be overjoyed with those who have joy. We want a tradition that's going to start hospitals for enemies. That get alongside the poor, get the hands dirty, and Stoicism could never do that. But that was Christianity's strong suit going back to Jesus. So much more to say on Stoicism. Uh, Future lectures. <laughs> Other questions in the room? I've got plenty here, but if you have one in the room, I want to make sure you get a chance to put your hand up and you can ask it while we're making your way there. Uh, this question, this is a multi-part question. Okay. Many of my friends who are not Christians bring up the fact that Christianity in the past and sometimes in the present has been used to inflict a lot of pain and harm on people. An example is the discovery of, in the Ameri of the Americas, the treatment of the indigenous peoples. How would you respond to this and show that this is not what Jesus stood for? Well, um, firstly, I totally agree. And in a way, that's what I was getting at when, I, when um, 
in my talk, I, I said that there are probably people here for whom the fact that there are so many hypocrites in the church is a reason to sort of stand at a distance from the Christian faith. I get it, totally. I guess you've got to ask yourself, when Christians are behaving badly like that, are they following Christianity or rejecting it? And already in the question, you can hear the answer. <laughs> um, because when the critic of Christian behavior criticizes us, actually, what they're saying is, you haven't been Christian enough. Aren't they? Isn't that what they're saying? You know, I know your master said love enemies, but I see you hating even your friends, let alone your enemies. Yes, the treatment of Indigenous people in my country as well as yours. Yes, sometimes wars started in the name of religion. Yes, torture. Yes. But the, the interesting question isn't, have Christians participated in these things? Because everyone has, every culture has. The Romans were doing just fine on war and torture before the Christians came along. Yeah? It's human to do th those things. The, the interesting question to ask yourself is, what is the unique thing Christianity gave the world? What's something Christianity gave the world that the Romans didn't have, that the Greeks didn't have? And I think this brings us to Jesus, the love of the enemy, being merciful to others. These things were unusual contributions of Jesus to our world. And, and so I would say to the, the person who's troubled by Christian bad behavior, yes, I agree with you, but, but can, can you not see that your problem is that Christians haven't followed Jesus well enough? So it's Jesus you want to be close to, even if Christians have let you down. So maybe you could go back and look at Jesus and try and find Christians that look vaguely like Jesus. Because the reality is, there are Christians that look like Jesus. It isn't that Christians always <clears throat> rape and pillage and, you know. Mostly, Christians are just bumbling along trying to love people. Like, I've been coming to this church a year now. And there's joy and there's love and there's friendship in this place. There's probably horrible things as well. But I think Christianity is hey. alive in this place. <clears throat> okay, I take that back. Sorry. Bro. Well, we absolutely are bumbling along here. And you're welcome to join us. Uh, here's, here's a good... One, good yes, please. Okay. Um, I'm on the fence. You can call me Thomas. And... Uh, What I find confusing, I believe in the teachings of the Bible and of Christ and how to live my life, but um, um, I have trouble with him being the son of God because the Christian religion out through history uses Christ and manipulates them, and these are the Pope, um, Christian leaders, ministers, pastors manipulate them, manipulates Christ um, to their advantage. Religion's a big business, you know. And there are a lot of reasons I could bring up, like, is Christmas really on, in December? No, it's not. History shows that Christmas was uh, actually in October uh, because that's when Mary and Joseph came to pay their taxes and that was the time of year they did. And Easter is not really Easter. And maybe Hallmark had something to do with it. I don't know. But um, the thing that I really have a problem with is Christian leaders, pastors and ministers, I hear it over and over again. If you're not Christian and you don't believe in that Christ is your Savior, you won't go to heaven. Now, I look at the billions of people on this earth, 
and many of them don't even know about Jesus and about God, and they could be very good and righteous people, and God's going to and prevent them from coming into heaven. I, I just can't wrap my head around that. And uh, is that manipulated by man that in order to go to heaven, you have to be Christian? And I think that's very elitist by the Christian religion to, uh, to say that and to spread that word. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it's quite a litany of things. Um, I, I would probably, if we had longer time, uh, pick a little argument with you over uh, Easter and Christmas, but we can, we can park that. Um, I won't pick an argument with you on uh, the fact that um, church leaders have manipulated Christianity and coerced people and made them feel guilty and controlled them. Uh, yes, absolutely. This is what I was saying in my last answer. Um, but there is still um, a real Jesus in those Gospels to confront. That isn't a manipulated Jesus. All those Gospels were written at a period where Christians didn't have power. So the Gospels themselves can't be the product of manipulation. The Gospels themselves were written by quite humble people in humble circumstances in a Roman Empire that was out to get them. And so the documents that we have leave us in no doubt that Jesus is the Son of God, He's the Lord, He's the Saviour. So we do have to grapple with the evidence and try and separate out the kind of bad experience of church history that, that you rightly reflect on. But the Gospels predate all the bad stuff, is what I'm saying. So I hope that we can all, you, um, but all of us, can go back to those Gospels, those actual first century accounts of Jesus' life, and try and forget about church and popes and crusades, and just go back to these original documents and see who the real Jesus claimed that He was. And I think you'll still be confronted with the claim that He is the Son of God, that He called on people to follow Him, that He is the way, the truth, and the life. They are words Jesus spoke. It wasn't a Pope that put them into the mouth of Jesus. They're actually His words. He said that He was the Savior of the world. So, um, it, it isn't pushy, elitist Christians um, saying those sorts of things. It's Christians thinking that Jesus was right. And just as it's n not a shame or th there's no problem thinking that you're right on certain things um, and that other people are wrong. Um, I mean, you just said, you know, the two billion Christians who think this way are wrong on, on your perspective. But I don't think you're being arrogant in saying that. You've just got to come to your own conviction about what is true. And those two billion Christians politely, hopefully, say, I'm, I'm not sure you're right. We actually think Jesus is right. It's not that we think we, the great ones, have arrived at the truth. We think Jesus arrived at the truth. And if I find myself convinced that he arrived at the truth, I can't think things that are opposite to what he taught. So, on the other question, the, the very difficult question about what God will do with those who haven't heard, my approach is pretty simple. God isn't going to condemn people for having not heard about him. That would make no sense. So, what's the criterion? The, cr the criterion is... Will God judge people according to what they did know? That seems fair to the degree that someone who's never heard of Jesus has faithfully responded to, the, to even the little truth that they did know. I think that would be a sign of God's work in them and I can leave them to the mercy of God. I'm not saying I know that they're safe because actually... Most human beings in their mo more honest moments know that they don't live up to their own standards, let alone God's. So, even if God isn't going to judge someone for nevi never having heard about Jesus, He would be well within His rights to judge people according to what they did know. And the problem is, most of us don't do what we know we ought to do. So, we'd all be in a pickle there. So, I just, I say, God... I don't know what's going to happen with those people, but I'm super thankful you have made clear a way I can know I am forgiven. And I want to share that with as many people as I can. That's the way I approach it, but much more could be said about that. We've got time for a couple more. If there are any, any others in the room, I can read a few more here. 
This one, John, is a little bit uh, theological. Um, mm. I know you'll, you'll like that. It says, in my limited knowledge, the word shalom in he from Hebrew seems to be very similar to the kingdom of God, which you talked about. How would you compare these? Uh, I would say, yeah, so shalom uh, is really the word for peace and wholeness, stillness and flourishing. Um, and I think that the truth is that um, the result of God's kingdom coming to make all things well will be shalom, peace, wholeness, flourishing. Well, there's one, uh, one, any other in the room here? I'll, I'll, we'll finish with this last one. If there's any others, anybody else? Okay, good. Okay, a couple more, sweet. Hi, I texted in because I was trying to avoid talking, but. Um, so my husband recently did a Bible study here in the men's group um, and read a book from David Platt called Follow Me. And I was reading the book, and there was something that kind of stood out that contradicted what I was taught since I was little. I was always taught, once you're saved, no man can pluck you out of God's hand. Well, in this Bible study, he says, um, like, if you believe that you're saved once, then, like, wherever you heard that is false, because there's nowhere in the Bible that says to say this sacred prayer to ask Jesus to come into your heart. So that was like a huge red flag for me what I was reading. Um, so I was just curious what your opinion was on that. Well, based on what you've just said, um, and not knowing that book, um, I think it's pretty clear in Scripture that um, those who have true faith will be safe to the end. God will keep them safe, that no one, Jesus himself said, no one will be able to pluck you out of my hand. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to criticise a book or an author that I've, I know nothing about, but I, I can think of sayings of Jesus and sayings of the Apostle Paul that would, uh, that convince me that a genuine Christian will be safe as a genuine Christian to the end. You can't pop in and out of God's family. I was looking to, I was reading the, the John 23 and says that the ministry of Jesus, uh, he's, he was about 30 years old um, when he started his ministry. So since, since you're talking about he, he, Jesus as a teacher, so can you try to explain when the, when the Bible said he started his ministry with about 30 years old, is when he became like a teacher and he was with the disciples and what was before him as a teacher, if you can explain that, uh, minish, the ministry part of it. Yeah, so um, it was a general principle uh, that, that one could begin a, to be an, an authority figure as a teacher at around 30. Exceptions were made for, you know, incredibly interesting, gifted people. But 30 is, a, is, a, is an age um, that was well known in Jewish communities as when teachers began their teaching. So um, Jesus fits that pattern. And he, no doubt, was involved in theological discussion and, and influence prior to 30. Uh, but launching his public ministry seems to have happened at 30. Uh, in fact, we, we know the date, AD 28, the 14th year of Emperor Tiberius. So, um, d does that answer your question? Yeah. And, and, and he only got a few years in, um, three years, yeah, maybe two, maybe four. It depends how we date things, but not, not long. I guess I have more of a couple of comments that bother me when I hear people like the gentleman in the front row who seem to focus on Christians and Christianity, those who believe, feel like their faith is the only way. And scriptures talk about how uh, people will hate Jesus, despise Jesus. Um, 
I think people that believe in Buddhism or Confucianism believe that their faith is the only route as well. But I only hear people complain about Christians who feel like our way is the only way. So I think I would answer that from apologistic standpoint, that every faith, if those are true believers, they believe their faith is the only way to heaven. Uh, secondly, <laughs> along the same vein, I hear people talk about how Christians in, throughout history have done all these evil acts. Now, I don't think Custer, for example, was a Christian. He, create, he, he did atrocities against the natives. Um, there were followers of Hitler who said they were Christians, but they did atrocious acts. We don't know if those people were Christians at all. But Christians seem to have this label placed on everybody who did all these atrocities. So I think from an apologistic standpoint, we should respond in like kind saying, we don't know if these people were Christians. If they were Christians, boy, it's not the same faith that we profess. Uh, yes and no. Um, I, I'm more comfortable just saying, no, nah, sometimes Christians suck. Um, <laughs> right, it was, it, it was, it was Jesus who, who, who said to his disciples, um, you hypocrites, why do you look at the log or the speck in someone else's eye when there's a log in your eye? He's saying that to Christians. So that to me is the justification for Christians accepting that they've done really bad things, that they've had a log in their eye through history. And for me, a powerful example is Martin Luther. I, I, I imagine you think Martin Luther was a Christian, the, the man who founded the Protestant Reformation. Pretty sure he was a Christian. Please don't tell he, was, he wasn't. Yeah, well, but this is, this is the thing. He, he wrote the most disgusting anti-Semitic things and advocating the burning down of synagogues, the killing of rabbis who taught Judaism. Martin Luther. Right, so, I, so I'm, I'm stuck there. I can't say Martin Luther wasn't a Christian. I think far more theological, theologically correct, if, if not very couth, is to say Christians suck sometimes. And... You know, so do I, um, and and I, you know, and I'm I'm fine with admitting that, um, and I, I rely on God's grace for Martin Luther, uh, and and for myself. Um, yeah, the longer the longer I read history, the more actually I'm I'm sympathetic with the historical past, and um, critical of myself, because actually my th my thought is. I wonder what people will be saying about me, about us, 200 years from now. What are my blind spots? Yeah. Before we wrap up, um, I know John didn't ask me to do this, but uh, if you're interested in reading about that very question about uh, the history, the Christian history and the good, the bad, and the ugly of Christians throughout history, John wrote a book called Bullies and Saints. I'm recommending it to you. I've read it and given it out. It's fantastic. It's honest. Not really. About, uh, uh, it's, it's better than average. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll accept hey, that. Hey, uh, a couple of you texted in this question, uh, versions of this question. If, if Jesus is such a good moral teacher, and if God is love, why, why does he allow such awful things to happen in the world? And uh, we didn't, I didn't ask it tonight specifically because that really is at the heart of what John's going to cover in the next two Saturdays. And so please come back, invite your friends to come back. We really want this to be a safe place to ask question you asked, Thomas, for all of us, <laughs> uh, just to be honest about what, what we wrestle with. And so thanks for being part of that. Let me offer a brief prayer, and then you can be on your way. Father, thank you for tonight and a chance to talk about your son, Jesus. And he means different things to each of us, but we're grateful for this opportunity to investigate, learn, and discover, question, and wrestle with who he is and what his teaching and life mean. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. See you next week. <laughs>